we are at maybe the best point for football in 2022. I mean, you got MLS hitting up as we head into some really crucial games to decide playoff spots. You have the European Football Leagues kicking off as well, the Champions League draw was announced, and the World Cup is only like 80-ish days away. There's a lot to look forward to, and there's a lot to talk about. In this edition of Quickfire News, I want to talk about the American influence we're seeing over in the Premier League, some of the recent World Cup jersey leaks, and also the race for the MLS Supporter Shield. So let's just dive right in. We're going to start off by talking some European football, and most importantly, the American Revolution that we're seeing take place over at Leeds United. Last season, as Leeds were potentially headed down to the championship, they put faith in a former MLS player and manager, Jesse Marsh. And after keeping Leeds in the Premier League, he did something so bold that only Jesse Marsh could do. He doubled down on the American Revolution. Two of Leeds' key signings this offseason included Brendan Aronson from Red Bull Salzburg for $30 million and Tyler Adams from Red Bull Leipzig for around $20 million. Again, I mean, this was kind of an all or nothing thing in my eyes. As an American manager with all the stigma and everything that comes with that, to be so confident to bring in two other Americans, I mean, that takes some balls because you know for sure if things don't kick off right away, those signings and, you know, the American manager would be the first thing that lead supporters were going to point to. But so far, so good. Everything's working out fabulously over at Leeds and I was already a huge Brendan Aronson fan from when he played with Philadelphia. I mean, just his fluidity on the ball and how he just never stops working always impressed me when I used to watch him in MLS. Then when he got into the USMNT camps over this past year, it was the same thing. I always loved when he got on the field, when he got on the ball, I could feel his energy that he brought every time he stepped on the pitch. And the great thing is, is he brought that right over to England with him. He showed some really bright moments in Leeds' first two games of the season against Wolves and Southampton, but then he really showcased his abilities in Leeds' 3-0 win over Chelsea, where he commanded the press and even scored his first Premier League goal after forcing Chelsea's keeper into a mistake. And I mean, just take a look at that touch map. For Tyler Adams, it's been a similar story. When Adams played in Germany, he was always being rotated around the team, playing outside back for a large part of his time there. But now he's in the middle of the park and he's excelling at that at Leeds. He's come in with a big task of filling the shoes of Calvin Phillips, but he's already up to speed. He's making important tackles. He's keeping the ball moving for this lead side. The key thing for both of these guys though, and their overall ability is their work rate. I mean, it's unmatched. They never stop running. And this is exactly what we want to see as the USMNT prepares for the World Cup. Americans making a name for themselves over in the Premier League, playing consistent minutes. Although it is unrealistic to think that this type of momentum we've seen over the first four game weeks in the Premier League will last forever, but I do see some very promising signs and obviously I'm really happy to see Jesse Marsh establishing himself over in England. And I'm also glad he's chosen to take some Americans under his wing as he does so. I'm not a lead supporter, but I'm definitely keeping an eye on their games when I can. On to the next story. It's a little bit more upsetting than the first story, and it involves some of the new kits for this upcoming World Cup. Now, this is kind of a two-part story. The first part is about what I think of the new USMNT kits. It was a few weeks ago, but the kits were leaked, and it seems that they're all but officially confirmed that these two kits will be the ones the USA wears for the World Cup in November. I mean, there's already been a bunch of stuff said about these shirts and all I can really do is lay it on some more. I mean, but like talk about some of the most uninspiring kits I've ever seen. Now, to be fair, I get what the new home kit is doing. Technically, I mean, the USA is kind of following this tradition of wearing all white kits. And I'm not saying that I'm a big fan of the white kits because personally, I'm a Waldo kit guy, but it's a white kit and that's the one we're getting this year. So. I expected that. I think where we're getting let down is the fact that Nike is using this template, which isn't a great template on a lot of their new kits. This weird cutout under the neck, it doesn't look good in my opinion. And the Nike ticks on the sleeve, I don't think that looks great either. Then you add in these small stripes on the sleeves and I mean, it looks like an American football kit. 
I will say in the long sleeve version, I do like it better. And honestly, this is a kit I could see growing on me. If you know, I see some more official photos of it. We see it on the pitch and maybe a few massive wins in the World Cup. But what I don't think will grow on me at all is the away kit. And this is what really frustrates me because a tie dye blue and black shirt, it's got no originality to it, no unique identity. And I honestly just can't believe this is what Nike thought of. Now, of course these aren't released yet. So maybe quite possibly if we're lucky, there's still a possibility it might be all right, but I doubt it. Even a few players have already stated their thoughts on social media. So at least we're not alone with thinking that these shirts are a disappointment. But if you want to feel better about the USMNT shirts, all you got to do is look over at what Puma just released for their World Cup teams. Now, I mean, this isn't Puma's first time releasing some totally off the wall kits. I mean, their third kits last year, yeah, they kind of got the same vibe. I think they're trying to mimic the Nike Total 90 kits from the beginning of the 2000s with the number in the middle of the circle, but it just doesn't work here at all. And when you think about people who don't get a number and a name on their shirt, now you're just gonna have this empty box in the middle of your stomach. I think the Egypt one could be the best one of these, but the worst one is definitely Serbian. Switzerland's kit is also pretty awful too, but they all follow the same design and none of them really look good. And finally, to wrap up this video, let's talk MLS and let's break down the Supporter Shield race that's going on right now. If you asked me a week ago who was winning the Shield, I'd pretty confidently say LAFC has got it wrapped up. I mean, they were already running this league and then they went through the summer while adding Chiellini, Bale, and another young DP and another DP. They even clinched a playoff spot being the first team to do so with about 10 games left. And they were sitting nine points above second place in the West until this past weekend when they traveled to Austin, the current second place team in the West, and got an absolute whooping, losing the game four to one. In this game, LAFC seemed hopeless. They were not creating much, and Gareth Bale, who was making his first ever start for this club, was invisible. And this all got me thinking. Did LAFC do too much this offseason? With an established chemistry amongst the squad, did transferring out six to seven players and bringing in five new faces upset that apple cart? I'd say no, because you're talking about real game-changing signings to an already stacked team, but I do think this could be an underlying reason as to why we saw the league's front runners drop three points against one of the bottom teams in the league in San Jose and then get totally outclassed by Austin. Currently, the race looks like this for the Supporter Shield. LAFC are in first place on 57 points. Second place, Philadelphia, who are on fire, only trail by three points, but LAFC do have a game in hand on them. And then in third, and really the last team with a shot at the Shield is Austin, who are also, you know, catching steam at this point, and they're six points behind them. I'm not as sure that LAFC will be able to clinch the Supporter Shield as I was a week ago, but I mean, they are still favorites in my eyes. I mean, you have so many great players, and you know, with, with a stacked bench, you should be able to pick up wins. I think it all really just matters if they're gonna gel together instantly, or if that's gonna take some time. Either way though, they're heading into the playoffs and they're definitely gonna be one of the favorites for MLS Cup this year. In the comments down below, please let me know who you think will win the Shield. Will it be LAFC or will Philadelphia or Austin get a shot to do so? Thanks for watching as always, and until next time, I'll see ya.